Uh, it's my pleasure to be introducing Dr. Edna Tan, who's an associate professor of science education at the University of North Carolina, in Gr North Carolina Greensboro. Her work is steeped in both research and practice partnerships, weaving together on the ground challenges, needs, and wisdom within research and theory. She takes a critical sociocultural approach in her work with minoritized youth and science teachers across informal and formal spaces. And her focus now is on how minoritized youth can be empowered in their STEM engagement and how such modes of empowerment, youth's identity work in STEM and their critical agency can be mobilized across STEM infused settings to position minoritized youth as capable and value member, valued members of STEM. We are very honored to have her at Inclusive SciComm as one of our keynote lecturers to present. But here we are scientists, science communication and youth's efforts in establishing a rightful presence in STEM. Join me in welcoming Dr. Edna Tan. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Tan, and I'm very glad to be here at Inclusive SciComm Symposium. This afternoon, I hope to share some thoughts on how historically minoritized youth, and primarily these are youth of color from low-income backgrounds, engage in science or STEM. And I will use these terms interchangeably, science and STEM, because they're used interchangeably in K-12, STEM education, teaching and learning, which is my world. We will consider how youth see science, think about science, who they imagine are people who do science and are good at science, and what science represents. In short, we will consider how science is communicated to youth in the K-12 setting, the perceptions, the stories, and myths that youth and some teachers tell themselves, and what such modes of science communication can do. Whether and how youth engage in science depends on what they think science is. I will also share uh, youth stories of possibilities and hoped for futures in STEM and how we might consider supporting them in authoring what um, we are calling a rightful presence in STEM. In this talk, I will be drawing from the collaborative work that my colleague Angie Kalouis Barton and I have been doing with youth and teachers in communities and in schools for the past 15 years. Our partners are both in North Carolina and in Michigan, and we thank the National Science Foundation for their continued support of this work. So when we think about STEM and how it is communicated to youth, we can look at the words that we use. Words such as hypothesis, metamorphosis, velocity. The images we find when we search for pictures of scientists. Who students most readily see as spokespersons in mainstream science programs for children and youth? We all know this guy. I'm sure he's lovely. And Wowcrats. Those of you with elementary school age children will love Wowcrats, two white brothers uh, who go on adventures in 20-minute bite-sized episodes. Very good for her as parents. I'm one of them. And then you have the stuff that say science and STEM, like science kits, and increasingly so, um, things that does making and makerspaces, and now also science kits targeted at girls. Not a bad thing. But how do you think about science? How do they describe science is a good indicator of science, how science is communicated to them. So here are some recent descriptions given by kids that we talked to, to just about two weeks ago. We, are, we gave them this question. I think science is blank and blank. Boring and hard, Alice, sixth grader. Something to do with chemicals. Ruben, seventh grade, reading stuff on the computer, Tim. Can be cool, most of the time not cool. <laughs> Shall be. Technology and weather, Derek. Another indicator of how science is communi communicated kid to kids is this draw a scientist test that um, science education researchers love to do. So here is one that is from a, a year ago, Shauna. Ah, this person is probably Albert Einstein. His hair is like that because he's shocked by electricity. And many, many youth, in-service teachers, pre-service teachers of science, draw this picture. There is always the crazy hair. You can bet your bottom dollar on it. There's always a lab coat, goggles, test tubes, and some form of explosion. After 30 years of science education reform, this is where we're still at. Another question we can ask students is who they think is the best student in science. This is very good data because it shows us how kids perceive the characteristics of someone who belongs in science. So here are two recent um, answers. 
Probably James. He's the one with his hand up all the time. He knows all the answers. The best student in science in my class is Caleb. He's the best in math. Aha, there's a relationship between math and science. And he goes to science camps and stuff and talks about it all the time in class. So he's, Caleb is the best science student. And then when I was in New York, you know the science school in the Bronx? You know who goes there? All the Asian kids. Asian kids are the best in science. So here's the problem space that is related to how science is communicated to children and to teachers. Inequity in STEM has been an enduring problem. This enduring problem is related to how science or STEM is being communicated to children and youth. As a field of STEM education, we also describe and understand the issue. In short, we communicate about the issues in terms of words such as achievement gaps, a lack of representation of persons of color and women in STEM fields, an inadequacy to access and opportunities for the aforementioned groups of the populace, and also an identity gap. We have found that when youth of color perform as well as the dominant culture in standardized test scores, they still do not see themselves as belonging in STEM. These words and signals um, tell us something about how science or STEM is communicated to historically underrepresented youth, youth of color, low-income youth, and girls. So let's look at some statistics from the National Science Board, specifically in the science and engineering indicators from 2018. So after 30 years of reform efforts, the numbers still give us grave concern. For example, I know the words are really small. 67.6% .6 of professionals in all STEM and engineering fields are white, compared to 6.4% of black professionals and 8.4% of Hispanic professionals. If we look at the gender numbers, they are equally uncheerful. Women represent only 28% in science and engineering occupations, and of that, only 8.2% are black women and 0.2% are Native American women. What do these numbers tell us about STEM? What do they communicate about who belongs in STEM? What do they suggest to us in terms of the norms and culture of STEM professions? What has this got to do with how we teach science and STEM in K-12 classrooms and informal settings, especially with minoritized youth? More trouble is afoot with the communication game. There are troubling statistics there are also troubling labels. Numbers and names are not benign. They communicate something. What comes to mind when we think about Title I schools? Now, these schools originally are named to describe as serving a high percentage of, of students from low-income families. They are intended to help all children succeed, whatever their background. More labels to consider and for us to mull over what they communicate. high need schools, describe schools with high teacher turnover rate and underprepared teachers. high need students describe students who live in poverty, are English language learners, experiencing tumultuous home lives. Now note that none of these descriptors say anything about students' interest in STEM or their academic abilities, but nonetheless, they have become proxies and indicators for students who are at risk and therefore deemed unlikely to succeed in STEM classes, and so they are counseled away from these trajectories in K-12. Therefore, the narratives of high needs have been deficit-focused, serving at-risk students. And for science, the narratives of high needs have been conflated with cannot be good in science. Here are some quotes from youth who spoke to me recently. When I walk into my science class, I know my teacher doesn't want me there. You know these things you have here, little bits? The snap together electronics, some of you might be familiar with, that we use in the after school program. Adam says, if my teacher has them in our classroom, I will not be allowed to touch them. I can tell you who would, but not me. James G reminds us that at risk, even if we were to take that term, doesn't have to mean anything more than a student not needing another bad learning experience. This is a much more empowering narrative for both students and teachers and a much better message to communicate. With deficit-oriented narratives, deficiencies have found landing spots in the individual student, in her family and neighborhood, in his under-resourced school. How we communicate about issues is not benign. Gloria Letson billings reminds us that instead of an achievement gap, we have an education debt created by the historical, economic, sociopolitical, and moral decisions and policies that characterize our society. One way to unpack this education debt in STEM education is to consider 
how systemic injustices are manifested in local practices, including in STEM learning settings. And these manifestations communicate something about STEM. Systemic injustices are systemic, not because they are uniform in nature, but because they are widespread and they are enduring. However, they manifest locally and are often contextually specific. When considering injustices in STEM, one serious manifestation is how our society has a history of environmental racism and hierarchical relationships between those who know science and how to manipulate scientific findings and those who do not. This goes beyond the STEM pipeline issues into everyday oppressions ineluctably tied up with STEM. One ongoing example that springs to mind is the Flint water crisis in Michigan and who the vast majority of victims are with the extreme weather patterns we've had of hurricanes. Overwhelmingly people of color, poor people from low-income communities, for example, in Puerto Rico, and most recently in the Bahamas, where we still, as of now, remain uncertain of the scale of damage. There is therefore a need to work towards equitable and consequential outcomes in STEM teaching and learning. We suggest that opportunities for equitable and consequential STEM learning attend equally to students' development of robust epistemic knowledge through valuing multiple epistemologies, which are different ways of knowing, while working to disrupt and restructure power dynamics in classrooms, science, and society. By equitable, we are concerned with opportunities for young people to deepen STEM knowledge and practices as a part of, not separate from, their own cultural knowledge and practices. By consequential, we suggest that leveraging STEM learning opportunities toward transformative outcomes aimed at addressing systemic inequities, such as supporting youth agency to engage in STEM, in their communities while disrupting power dynamics in the here and now. Other transformative outcomes include expanding youth social networks for STEM in ways that promote greater inclusivity through engaging with a wider range of stakeholders and viewing STEM experiences as happening across scales of activity, spaces, and time. Therefore, we need to pay attention to unpacking the potential connections between informal and formal settings that you engage with STEM holistically and to study what moves between these settings that impact their continued STEM engagement. We need to take a wide lens on how STEM is and can be communicated to youth based on how they are supported or not to do STEM in these settings and how they eventually can build towards a trajectory. In our longitudinal work, we have followed youth across time and space to investigate how they experience STEM and therefore what they consider STEM to be and how systemic injustices may be manifested very specifically in local practices across these different spaces. We are interested to more explicitly understanding the mobilities of STEM resources across the spaces that may be related to youth STEM engagement. What moves, what does not, why and how and what tensions emerge. Having such insights on such mobilities can tell us about the nature of the messages youth are getting about STEM in these different spaces. These considerations speak to what we value as legitimate STEM knowledge and practices and are critical for working towards justice in STEM learning and teaching. Multiple epistemologies, ways of knowing, communicate whose knowledge counts in science, why and how, what are the implications for students' engagement in what we value in STEM. These questions center who has the power to know in STEM and what forms of knowledge matter and are all related to how youth view what STEM is and the potential role STEM may have in their lives. How science is communicated to youth varies by context. Uh, consider this transcript. Sarah says, I hate science at school. Why? It's boring, we don't do nothing. What would you like to do? The stuff we do here at Get City, which is an informal STEM program that she was involved in. Autumn and Iana have come up with a term to name and describe the kind of STEM they do in the informal science class. And they say it is called fines. They even tell you how to pronounce it. Fines is what describes Get City. It's science that's fun. Get City knows how to make science fun without getting bored. Instead of a bored face, you will have a happy face. Okay, Autumn and Yana, what exactly does that mean? Can you operationalize that for us? Here it is, five principles. We know what we are doing. We know how to make a difference. We know how to save energy and how to convince others of better ways to do things with electricity. 
That is one way we are experts. We are community science experts. So to explicitly mine for youth-focused, community-based knowledge that the youth can leverage towards equitable and consequential STEM learning, we, in our various projects with kids, enacted community ethnography in STEM learning experiences, both in our work in the classrooms and in the informal spaces. The idea is to communicate that local communities matter in science. Local communities are the backbone of youth science engagement. This community ethnography process entails equipping youth with ethnographic skills to robustly solicit community feedback through surveys, interviews, and observations on a range of issues they care about and to analyze that data alongside complementary STEM knowledge and practices. Integrating community-based STEM engagement support us in privileging multiple forms of interactions and open up STEM-related interactional spaces for youth and community members. Here are two stories of youth of color in informal community STEM clubs engaging in what they call science or science that matters. The first case is that of the geodesic play dome, which started with these two young ladies, Ariel and Sharon, wanting to solve a community problem. Ariel and Sharon are members of a weekly after school maker club that takes place in a community space, a local boys and girls club. So here is some background. Their community club just moved from very old premises to a spanking new building. However, the new building is shared with the headquarters of a religious organization that oversees the youth community club in their city. The religious headquarters also has a childcare faculty uh, facility on the premises. Using iPads, the youth went around the club serving their peers and club adult mentors on, are you happy with our new club? What do you miss about our old club? What do you wish we have in our new club? So they found that um, though the youth and a lot of the smaller children were very happy with the new community space, they were feeling constrained. The data showed that there was a general consensus of a lack of toys. For example, the playground is newer and smaller and there is a fence around it. We need to share so we get very little time out in the playground. Kids need to move. You cannot climb, lie down, you have to be very careful. The new stuff, the new couch, the new chairs, the new everything. Everything is new. Don't touch. Through engaging in community ethnography, the youth identified how feeling constrained was experienced by children in their club. A lack of play, especially in terms of embodied play, where they have to move their bodies with structures. And this led them to research buildable play structures, which led them to this 50-piece structure of a geodesic play dome. In order to do so, they had to draw on and become proficient in STEM or maker-based epistemologies. When Sharon and Ariel further observed children crawling into the dome with toys and books, they decided that some form of lighting for the interior of the dome was necessary. Because we had talked about environmental sustainability in the STEM club, they experienced with solar panels, and they built the circuits that you can see in the picture up there, where the solar panel is on the outside and the lights are on the inside of the dome. So we see a coherence in how science, what it is, what it does, who can do science, is communicated to the youth in this example. We see the movement of ideas and resources between the youth's community club into the STEM maker space that is also hosted at the club, but in a different room, and also between the community spaces and the local university maker process, a mentor who came and gave the girls comments and feedback on what they were building. These mobilities were supported by STEM club mentors and the community club staff. They encouraged the girls to go talk to other children. They, they let them wander around. And these mobilities could easily be shut down, but in this case, happily, it was facilitated. What do the youth think science is about and, what, and who can do science in this case? The people of science, in this case, include children and youth at the club, the STEM maker club mentors, the community club mentors, maker mentors from the local university uh, who gave the girls feedback about the materials to use and what to better secure the cardboards when the hot glue gun was just not cutting it. The issues relevant to science include community-specific knowledge on the structure of play, uh, sorry, on the lack of play structures at the club, the physical needs of children to move, and the disciplinary content knowledge relevant to that. The processes of science include community ethnography, iterative process for engineering design, purposefully learning STEM content that is relevant to this project, many feedback sessions, and observations. And the artifacts and symbols of science is a functional play structure prototype and all the in-between materials when they were working on this for a few months. 
And Miss Martha, who is a mentor at the club, says of the dome, it is the best thing ever. I love it. The kids go in there to sleep. The parents see it. It's in the lobby. It's wonderful. So the next case is about Stephen's light up football. Stephen made a light up football at his community STEM club after surveying community members about safety issues that concerned them. So he said, when little kids are playing outside football and it's getting too dark and they keep playing, somebody might get hit in the head because they can't see the ball. So I'm going to light up the football so you can see where it is going. Stephen went through many iterations with community feedback before having a functional prototype. Some iterations included figuring out what kinds of lights to use so that minimum heat is given off because he doesn't want to burn little hands. The position of the lights is also important because the surface of the ball has to be smooth because your hands are going around it. The weight of the ball has to be um, a specific weight because when you throw it, I don't do football, but it has to turn in a certain way. <laughs> Steven's mom was the one who gave him this feedback about, look, you want to play football with the kids in our neighborhood? Nobody has money, nobody has protective gear. The football cannot be hard. So feedback from his cousins, who played in a local team, also helped Stephen refine his prototype. They complained to him that his ball was wobbly and weighted wrongly, and he had to consider where to weight the, ball, um, the rechargeable batteries that he was using to, fuel, uh, to power the ball. And eventually, he figured out how to get the batteries at the center of the gravity and also how to wedge tube lights into the ball to maintain the smoothness of the ball. So I'm going to go, let Stephen tell you a little bit about his story. Hopefully this works. It's not playing. I have a genie here. Matt's going to help me. My name is Stephen Hardin. I'm 11 years old. I live in sixth grade, and this is my first year at DC. Stephen, why did you decide to make the light up football? When, well, when we look at the outside football, it's not too dark. It needs to keep playing, and someone might get hit in the head so they can see where the ball going. So I made a light up football so I can see where the ball goes. What do you think I should change about my football? Is it waterproof? Um, let's find out. <laughs> so, uh, we want to see if this football is waterproof. Well, it's wet, but I think it's still a work. Let's see. Throw it if it's not, if it's heavier, like. How far can you throw it? 
Well, this is probably about as heavy as a real football. So you probably, depending who the quarterback is, whoever's throwing it, could probably throw it the same distance as a real football. How will you play football at night with somebody like a football? How would I play with yours? I would play very well with it. If I can see the ball coming, or if it's dropped, or if it's in the air being punted or kicked, you can see it very well. Will you tell your friends about my life of football and you liked it? I would, absolutely. Okay, my last question is, how much would you pay for my life of football? Well, I don't know. You probably would have to determine how much you want to sell it for. Then I would have to determine how much I'm going to buy it. Yep. Hey, Stephen helped us to make that video. He's very excited. I'm showing it to you today. I will tell you that you laugh at all the appropriate spots that he wanted you to laugh at. <laughs> oh. Okay, so here's the part where he's um, not very happy. When Stephen tried to bring his football into sixth grade science classroom, that request was denied. His sixth grade teacher considered what Stephen did at Guest City to be irrelevant to school science. That's what you do outside in formal science, nothing to do with school science. This illustrates gatekeeping practices and a different message about science as being conveyed to Stephen in school science, the gatekeeping domain. And therefore, a coherent message about what science or STEM is for children across these spaces cannot be assumed. What message do we think Stephen is getting from his school science teacher about science and what counts as science? However, his physical education teacher welcomed his football, which is sending a whole different message to Stephen and one that might lead Stephen to conclude that maybe innovating a light-up football is not in the world of school science, but in football? I don't know about that. What do you think? So how is science communicated to Stephen and his community in this case? The people of science are the local communities, the youth, the adult mentors, a football star. They're all legitimate and all are involved in science. That science can be concerned with the local equity issues, such as the lack of street lighting in low-income neighborhoods and the lack of play opportunities, and the challenges to youth that could present coupled with high gang recruitment activity, and that these issues are intersect with STEM. This is the reason why Stephen wanted to build the Light Up Football. The processes of doing science is active, collective, and involves many iterations that take place across time and space. And the artifacts of science can be an innovative Light Up Football that is still in use today. However, in school, in Stephen's school, what is communicated is all the traditional things that we, we know and are worried about. Nothing has changed in how science is communicated to Stephen in his school while he is simultaneously doing this kind of science in his after-school club. The next two cases are from our work in sixth grade science classrooms where the teachers are enacting an engineering curriculum Engineering for Sustainable Communities. This curriculum focuses on students' productive identity work in tandem with their developing engineering design expertise and STEM content knowledge. Again, community ethnography, what does community have to do with engineering, features heavily in these two stories. Students spend time crafting survey questions for their school community on what issues the school faces and is grappling with that is preventing their school from becoming happy and healthy. Uh, in these two case studies, the story that I want to tell is that student morale and issues of justice are part and parcel of doing science. The first case is called Occupied. It is a light-up sign a group of youth made for their in-classroom bathroom that does not lock. In this school, every class has their own bathroom and many of the doors do not lock. From their survey, this was identified as an issue. Specifically, bathroom bullying was an issue and within that issue, the targeted bathroom bullying of Hispanic boys was identified as important. As a result, many boys have been limiting their water intake so as to minimize bathroom use. Miss L, the science classroom teacher, was not aware that this was going on.
like do a demonstration. Yeah, when I do a demo. Uh, I'll be in here. I'll be in here. You're gonna leave the bathroom. Okay. Supposedly, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to not let somebody would answer, or you would slowly open up the door. He just, he just like opened the door carelessly. Why it is a problem is because embarrassment. Embarrassment. That's another one, and like people will start trends around the school, like in this, like, like in the sixth room hallway. They'll, they'll either make up rumors. It's either that or they make up rumors. It's it's ridiculous, and so we wanted to try to stop or and, and other kids from prevent that from happening. So we just thought like that's a really big problem. was using it and this way light when the lights are on you will know not to come in and then we have this sign for reference. Okay so now let's show here. Okay so we have our solar panel right here that's taped to the wall and the light is making the energy come through. Just, just, just to make sure, and I'm just letting you know, this duct tape doesn't, it doesn't rip off any paint. Yeah. Because at first we only started with one light, which I guess for some people it wasn't, it wasn't too bright and not too standing out. We had it like a darker red, but it, was, it wasn't working. And then when it was sort of working, you really you could see sort it. Sort of yeah. you could see it. To think that like the green paper would stick out more than pretty much any other color. So what do you think she sees in you that she didn't see before? Guys. Oh, how I think we work together and how like we, like the teamwork and like the, the amount of brains and s just ability to do stuff and work. Like every time when we were working on it, we were good group because when someone was getting frustrated, another person would take over and like try fixing it, and when that person got frustrated. The next person stepped in, and we all sort of helped each other when we didn't understand it or anything in, in the building process. There's been, it's been a couple of weeks since the last time someone got walked in. So how is science communicated to students in this case? The people of science included the youth themselves, their embodied experiences in the school, um, family members as Mateo's uncle, electric, uh, electrician, who talked to him at home giving advice about circuits. Uh, that was the boy that was talking in the video. Community engineers who came during a feedback cycle to give them ideas. They also tested a lot of solar panels to see which one would, would um, power the three blue LED lights that they wanted to use. The process of science um, I'm, I'm sorry, the issues of science in this case included bathroom bullying and specifically racialized bathroom bullying were concerns that have scientific relevance and they were equally important to disciplinary content knowledge in STEM. The processes of science is active and also community-based and involves 
um, iterative process of uh, engineering design, purposeful learning of disciplinary content, trial and error, community feedback sessions. The artifacts of science, the stuff of science, goes beyond textbooks and pen and paper tests to include messy sketch-ups, community feedback, and a functional prototype of an innovation that occupied that had a community impact in the issues that um, the students face and continue to bring social changes in their classrooms. Other classrooms came and saw this, and now they are also building occupies for their bathrooms that do not lock. So here is another example from an engineering um, sixth grade classroom. This is the light up bingo cage for fair participation. Uh, the survey questions that the students crafted, what are some challenges to our school being happy and healthy? There are some options there for you to see that um, people could pick. And they asked, what are your ideas for engineering designs that kids could make that could help solve these problems? There were also open-ended questions. This group zoomed in on the data that came from the open-ended questions. They were compelled by responses on a survey that talked about there needs to be more equal opportunities for everyone, more opportunities to use more people's ideas, more chances to argue ideas and opinions in class, specifically because teachers are picking the same five target students. Paul, one of the kids who are in this group, conjectured that a light-up bingo cage with the names of the classmates on the balls would help his class have more opportunities for everyone to participate because in his words, he says, everyone has a chance to be called on. It is no longer, oh, I want to participate and then put my hand up. It's more of you have to answer because you've been called on. So Paul felt that while he himself always had his hand up to participate in class, it would be good for the community to participate because in his school, um, the classrooms, uh, the grade, the participation grade is included in the final grade. So they also went through a few rounds of iterative design with community feedback and they made substantive changes to their design in order to encourage their teacher to use the bingo cage as often as possible. So their design went from needing two persons to operate the bingo cage, one to turn the lever to pop up the person that's going to answer the question, and one to turn the hand crank that will light up the decorative mat at the bottom of the cage. So they want this to be a festive, celebratory kind of thing where students are not being stressed about, oh, maybe I'm the one that has to answer this question. But needing two persons to work this device will um, not be very encouraging for the teacher who has her rules in her classroom that she doesn't want things to be disruptive. And so they went through many iterations to hack the, um, the hand cranks and to fix it onto the lever of the bingo so that one person could turn the lever and at the same time power the LED mats. Kaysen's father, Kaysen is his girl in, in the second picture, helped her to take apart the hand crank at home to see what are the bits that they will need um, so that it will be, still be functional when it is attached to the lever. And what does Miss D, the teacher, say about this innovation? She talks about, Miss D, Miss D, don't call on anybody. Don't forget, go get the bingo. Go get the bingo thing. And she said, and either Paul or Kaysen pops up, they go and get it, they assume the position. And I have to call on whoever um, the ball pops out. How is science communicated to students in this case? The people of science, again, the youth themselves, their community, family members such as Kaysen's father, Miss D, who helped them to print out the names of their classrooms, who opened up her classroom during lunch and after school so that the kids could keep working. What were the issues of science? Classroom morale and fairness concerns relating to student participation norms, disciplinary content knowledge in STEM were equally important. The processes of STEM is active and also community-based and involves the same things that I've talked about with the Occupy. The artifacts of science included a real functional innovation, the Light Up Bingo Cage for Fair Participation, that had a community impact. The students were able to use STEM to address a current issue they face that may continue to bring social changes. So in both the Occupy and the Bingo examples, we see movement of ideas, people, a coherent message of STEM from the youth salient communities into the formal STEM settings. There is a congruence in the messaging of what STEM is and can be across these spaces. I'm running out of time. Here's an example of a happy box that was another artifact. And this one is a light up happy messaging box that the girls invented that had a transgender kid on the surface of the box. This was the state that was embroiled in the bathroom law. And so for the girls to, to pick this up and to press it in an engineering class uh, was very encouraging and very compelling. Here is a light up, portable light up desk system that's engineered by um, Jane. And she engineered this portable system because kids could not see 
where the staff was in, under the desk and were late getting to classes and therefore were punished by silent lunch, which is the worst thing that happened to a 12-year-old. And so, so she innovated this so that kids could find things quickly. Okay, I'm gonna zip through this last example because it is about refugee youth and a STEM club in the residential community. When we consider refugee youth, recently resettled refugee youth, what is community to them when they have been marginalized um, for the whole time and they have been perpetually positioned as the other for their entire lives? What is community to them? What is science to them? The previous examples showcase citizen youth. We see that doing science grounded in community with community is what they consider as science that matters, is what communicates to them that they belong in science. But what of refugee youth? Most of whom grew up in refugee camps and knew only persecution. When they landed in their adopted city, families were primarily housed in three local residential neighborhoods for refugees. Now in this space, the issues the girls were thinking about included there are other ethnicities, they are not the only refugees in this space, they are in a new land, there are language issues, they are really stressed out, and there is a lack of privacy. And from the pictures, you can see that the messaging from the walls of this space, this is a refugee community space that is filled with advocates for refugees to help them catch up in the school system. But you can see that on the walls, it is all vocabulary um, charts and things that you can or cannot do. All these shouting out and communicating to the girls of their otherness, of their lack, of their marginality, which ironically is what they have been fleeing from. 14-year-old Sloan describes the community. This center is very important to us because of the technology. We have no technology at home as so we come here to do the technology, but it is ugly. The walls are ugly. You have only vocabulary posters and flyers. You have doctor information. What the landlord says you can and cannot do. It makes you feel very stressed when you walk into the center after school. The center should be pretty. We want to not be stressed. We want to feel relaxed when we come back to the center because school is already very, very stressful. What do you think about science? I'm very bad at science, it's so hard. A lot of hard words, I have to say, have to spell, cannot remember the words. Just copy, copy, copy words from the slides or the textbook. I don't know what I'm copying. Today my teacher gave me this and she took out a worksheet with atoms on it and I copied these words. I don't know what it is. What is it? What can we do about ugliness using science? Having these conversations with the youth, the girls profess that they enjoy art, they want to beautify the center, and they are worried about the artistic ability, and they don't know any science. So we decided to just incubate ways of knowing and how science and community can come together for refugee girls. They decided to make an electric art, a piece of electric art. So the case suggests that the need for opportunities to incubate community epistemologies, especially with youth who are very marginalized like the refugee girls. There is a necessity to give time to talk and wonder and play around with art, which is what they wanted, uh, with, with science when it makes sense to see what can happen. So as they work on this project, we, they decided that they were poor artists, so we used some spirographs, which they created uh, very nice drawings out of, and they were trying to figure out what they wanted to say with this piece of art. Where do you think these things go? There's these four big pictures, there's this little one, there's too much space. These are all transcripts from the sessions that we've had with them. And this reminds us of what um, Eve Tuck says about desire-based research frameworks that require epistemological shifts accounting for not just the loss and despair, but also the hope, the visions and wisdoms of lived lives and communities. Desire is involved with the not yet and at times, the not anymore. In short, we view Equitable Here as supporting and promoting the knowledge and practices that enable youth's agentic response to the desires of the not yet and their efforts to reclaim the not anymore. In the process of incubation, the girls also accrued an increasing understanding and expertise in building circuits and related STEM epistemologies. It will be so beautiful with the LED lights. This is what Rami, who was 14, said. So they learned about circuits. And here are a range of things that are STEM, STEM related that were birthed from making this project. There was a reason to know about circuits, to know about resistors, to know about what a switch is, how to build one, how it works, and how to power this piece of art with minimal financial and environmental cost. In the end, the product is beautiful and it hangs in the community space. And this is what Rami says, this big red one, or me, is us or me, the ones around it are my family and closest friends, 
Others are coming to join our community, so we are expanding and becoming more together. Also, our friends in school who are born here, nobody is leaving. We are coming together. It is one world. I want to expand my world and still be me. We see that with incubation, in this case, both what the community can be and what science can be, the girls can start to name, the girls can start to imagine, the girls can start to be in STEM. And this, we think, is very agentic and very purposeful. The goal was to author a sense of belonging in a hostile environment. The goal was not to become good at STEM. The goal was to seek for a rightful presence. The idea of authoring a rightful presence in STEM means that one does not need to keep asking to be included, asking for rights to be conferred by someone who is more powerful. Rightful presence means that one has legitimized membership in a classroom community because of who one is, and not who one should be, in which the practices of the community support restructuring power dynamics to what more just ends through making both injustice and social change visible. Think about how you are in your own homes, where we belong and where we are not guests. We have ways of being that signify rightful presence. We have stuff around that claim the physical space as our territory. We have choice in salient activities that take place in this space that is our home, that belongs to us, and to which we belong. For the youth we worked with in the stories I've shared, they have created stuff, artifacts of science, that remain in space that are what we call signature science artifacts. They are authentic, STEM-robust artifacts that claim both space and status for their creators as rightful STEM doers with STEM expertise, directly applicable to improving not just their lives in the here and now, but the lives of their community. In terms of what is current, the idea of who represents science and the impact a spokesperson can have on science is vividly embodied in Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish climate activist who undoubtedly inspired many youth in her age group. Youth whose generation has real skin in the climate game because, as their placards say, there is no planet B on which they can grow up and live their lives. In the last year, major newspapers such as The Guardian were persuaded by this movement to change their language on climate change to climate crisis. Last Friday, we saw massive protests globally in a resounding communication to the ruling bodies that paying attention to science matters in our everyday existence. According to Vox, the event was truly global and astonishingly well organized. There were over 2,500 events, 160 countries, all seven continents. Across the globe, over 4 million protesters took to the streets in the US, in Chennai, India, in South Africa, in Australia. The often invisible allies that support and fuel the momentum include community organizers, teachers, parents, school administrators, city workers. In spite of the global reach and demanding action on climate crisis, there is now a global movement. When we zoom in in each city, the climate protest was a communal, local effort. Individuals, specific stakeholders in local communities coming together made up the millions of protesters overwhelmingly young people and children. Numbers and names are not benign. They communicate something, and it makes a world of difference between being marginalized and having a rightful presence when we ask who can partake in the STEM discourse, who can show up, and who can tell a story. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, so just raise your hand if you'd like to ask one. So I'm glad that I'm glad. Um, I'm glad that you brought engineering to the picture. I am an engineer, and I've been teaching introduction to engineering design for decades now. And I think it's a great way to inspire young people to think about science and math in purposeful ways. But uh, as I saw some of the projects, I could tell whoever was helping them had a thing for LEDs because <laughs> everything's about lighting up, and engineering is not just about lighting things. So that there's something about Reduct, reduction of science into one type. So we need to move away from something like that because you, 
if you're not an electrical engineer, you cannot be an engineer. So that's one thing that I will like to mention because I think there's a lot that we can do with this approach. But one of the things that struck me a lot was when they were doing the first experiment, um, there was an easy solution that was not even mentioned. And you know, when you talked about science, science has to be in the context of common sense. And so having a light, when you have a lot of distractions, like on that door, that will be the very first thing that I will bring up with my students. How can we increase the contrast between the light that we have, which is very small, with the background? And you have a lot of words and a lot of you know, um, noise. And so it makes for a perfect moment for teaching. You know, simplifying, not complicating. Another thing is science. It also have to see where is the lights coming from. You had a light a solar panel that was getting the energy from a solar, from, from a light. That's, I'm sorry, nonsense. Um, if it was coming from the sun, it makes sense. But it's not when you have to turn on the light so you can get the energy from that light bulb to go into the solar panel so you can go to the lights. So there's some kernels of goodness here, but there's a lot of still, we have a very long way to go to use science properly and to teach it to our children to do good things with it. It's not about you know, just keeping them busy creating something that we can show. It really is about creating better science. And I'm an engineer for decades. This kind of thing has been going on for too long. We got to do better, and we can do better. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to push back. So the reason that this was the, the curriculum was designed the way it was is that we need to encourage teachers who are under a lot of stress and pacing guides and exams and the syllabus to take up this kind of work. And the reason why the content that was, was, that was selected was what it is, is because it meets the standards, the NGSS standards in sixth, seven, and eighth grade science. So this is how we make sure that teachers are willing to take it up. We have to understand that teachers are under a lot of stress and we cannot expect them to take up things that are risky if the risks are not ameliorated and supported. So that's one thing. The other thing about the, um, the solar panel and the light bulb, we think that it was brilliant that the students designed it the way they did because while they understood that the solar panel change, changes sunlight into electricity, that was not going to work in that bathroom because there was no window. And so what is a source of light that was already there? When you flick on the light to go into the bathroom, it was the bulb. And so they used that system to power the solar panel. So there's no other additional um, energy that has to be generated when the occupied is being used. So that's, how, that's what, what I'm pushing back on. I also would push back on this being cursory or slight and to make for, make for show. These projects came from community ethnography. The kids really went and surveyed 64, 100, 120, up to 200 people in the community. They are trying to find an issue that is local, that means something to people in order to engineer. Now, the argument can be made that there are a lot of engineering curriculum out there that is very robust epistemically that teachers do use in a classroom, but a lot of students do not identify with them. Why do I have to consider an imaginary scenario about this person having this problem in Ghana that I'm trying to engineer a solution for in this kit when there are all these existing local issues in my school? So I would argue that grounding the reason for why we engineer in community is something that is very empowering for students of color who do not get these opportunities much in a very epistemically robust way. Yeah. Um, hello, I'm your next um, person who's going to ask you. And first, thank you for pointing out co-creation, which also is a way to break these barriers. But the second that I'm thinking since the beginning of your uh, presentation is the language that we need to use. And um, in my case, I use communities that promise, right? It's like a positive way. But sometimes for funding, you need to use these words of low-income communities, children at risk. What would you suggest to change this language, or how can we create this movement to change the language 
when we refer to these communities that we are serving. So, so there is some, some direction, some movement in that. And, and um, so traditionally, traditionally underrepresented is now not in use that my research team had decided not to use okay. in conversation with communities. So when we have been in these communities for more than 15 years, we are now um, closely related to some of the friends. You know, we are in the community that will call ourselves insider outsiders. So some of the parents and the grandparents who work at the club and um, club leaders who are from the community tell us that, because we involve them in our grant writing now, right? In true RPP spirit. And so they say, we have a problem with traditionally underrepresented because it is not our tradition to be underrepresented. <laughs> when you think about traditionally underrepresented, there is a hint towards this is something that was, that's cultural, that's in the community. And they really helped us to understand that that is a terrible message to send. It is not our culture. It is not our tradition to be underrepresented. That is something that has happened to us. And so the other uh, movement is away from marginalized, because when you think about marginalized, if you look at the numbers, youth of color are not marginalized. In fact, they are becoming the majority, right? So using the word minoritized um, sort of puts the lens more on the system. The system of power now is minoritizing particular groups of students. So that's one way in which the, move, the, the language, we're more, being more intentional about the language that we're using. Um, yeah. um, thank you for a really great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I'm wondering about the little videos that you show. Is this part of the things, like do kids do them? Is this part of the things you teach them? In that case, they're doing science communication, which is really cool. Yes, so I think this ties in really really well with this conference. So the, the videos were co-created with the kids. That's why, I mean, we, we are not as cool. We won't have all those really interesting things that they want to put in there and the music. And the reason why it is co-created is we are, we are bringing some of these children to professional development sessions that we're running for teachers. Hear it from the horse's mouth, right? So a lot of times kids are not at the table when decisions are made about them or what they need or what learning experiences will be the best for them. So we think, hey, you should hear from the kids themselves. So a lot of this media that we're creating is being shared in professional development sessions with teachers when sometimes the kids zoom in and talk with the teachers as well. So Stephen knows that I'm here today showing you his video. Hi, over here. Um, could you expand a little bit more on um, how you see children's development in this process? Um, what your expectations are in terms of what they're able to do and what you hope they can do shortly after some period of growth? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to use them. I'm going to, uh, the, the happy stories, I'm going to give you the happy stories first. So we followed some of these kids for more than 10 years, and the happy story, there are three of them, um, they have managed to stay in STEM. And there is no causation, but they say that because of the consistency of the informal STEM program in which they have participated for seven to eight years, they are able to be, stay interested in science. They are able to use their participation and us writing reference letters for them to get access to informal STEM summer camps run by local universities as a way to then, for some of them, start a four-year college in engineering. We have two kids who are in engineering, we had one that got a full scholarship to Harvard and one that got a full scholarship to, oh my gosh, what's that word, Notre Dame. But these are very small numbers, right? And we also work with the kids, a small number of kids for a long time. The, the, it, is not, it is not idealistic, it's not rosy. The thing that is a challenge is what I showed you with Stephen's um, case. How the kids are participating in the informal STEM space is robust, how they're participating in school is still very marginalized. And while we are very happy that they're making such progress in informal science, the fact remains that the gatekeeping is, is in the school science classroom, which is why now we are working with teachers in classrooms. A lot of times, kids have to have advocates who are either parents or teachers. Um, and you know, with the group of students we work with, 
a lot of times that is not possible, right? Because of parents who are working or parents who do not have the language to advocate and teachers who use a deficit lens with these kids. So a lot of times the researchers, those of us, so again, the nature of the RPP comes up. We become more than researchers, we become friends, we become allies, we figure out how to be allies, you know, in, in ways that will help the kids to move forward. So we write a lot of reference letters, you know, um, with the refugee kids. I have tutored them from everything from Shakespeare to Frankenstein, often over Facebook. Because when you are in community and doing RPP, you do not have the luxury, and nor should you, I don't think it's ethical, to start saying, oh, this piece belongs to me, and that piece is out of my expertise, and I can't help you with that. If you have something to ask about atoms and covalent bonds, maybe I can help you, and I've taught them that, but not about Frankenstein or Shakespeare. That doesn't work. Lives are happening now. Kids are in sixth, seventh, eighth grade now. They have to jump through the hoops now. What do you do as a partner in RPP? Hi. Ooh, really loud. Um, Lisa Torres Gerald, Nebraska Wesleyan. Um, this may be a small question, but in terms of you mentioned um, the history of oppression of communities of color, and I'm wondering about because um, this came up in my dissertation. I'm wondering how science communication can begin to bring. Uh, build relationships with community members that do have a distrust of science, even with scientists of color. So I, you hinted at it just now, but if you could elaborate. Um, okay, so this might be obliquely relevant. So we, we, do, we work very hard to bring in scientists and engineers of color who look like the youth that we work with. So, so we've contacted practically every um, African-American woman engineer in our city, and happily some of them are coming to work with the kids. The idea of systemic oppression and how science can intersect, I think for us, um, really, it really helps when we open up the floor to the kids to say, really, what are the community issues that are that you are concerned with now. So one of the projects that I didn't show here was that a group of um, African-American teenagers with their making space, they made um, what they call, uh, oh my gosh, I'm like a, a, a jacket that is powered by wind turbines because they are running and has an alarm that they can press when they are running away from police officers. Mm. So this was in the discourse of Black Lives Matters and police brutality to black teenagers. I remember, they call it a phantom jacket. It's a phantom jacket because when they put it on, they can become invisible, that is in their imagination, but they can press a, a, an alarm because they are running away from danger. And, and the thing that is so true and forces us to confront it is that the people that they are running away with are the police officers. I think that's when the discourse of systemic oppression that is visited upon teenagers' bodies right now is brought to the fore in a way that STEM can intersect very productively uh, with. So we're, of course, we're not talking with them about you know, the, the whole nature of science and the whole whitewashing of Western science, yet that's not what we're we are talking about with the kids now. But we're simply trying to help them see and experience that STEM belongs to all communities. You can use STEM in your everyday lives now to do something. Um, last question over here, the person with the mic. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Desan from Rocky View Science Outreach. Um, and I'm going to give a shameless plug that I'm going to follow some of this conversation in Atrium 2 afterward if you're interested. Because um, I'm specifically interested in science, like biology, chemistry, geology, the creation of knowledge in this side. And I know you said you were using these terms broadly, which is, which is fine, but in the context of the students using science knowledge and doing engineering, at some point you have a conversation with them about how these processes translate to creating science knowledge. Are you asking about the components of the nature of science and how science is its own way of knowing and engineering maybe is another? Correct, yes. 
So within the engineering curriculum, and engineering is a separate but connected standard in the next generation science standards, we do talk about engineering practices, specifically defining a problem and um, designing a solution within constraints. So that is um, in, within, as we understand it, the domain of engineering. However, because this is K-12 science, inclusive science in a middle school um, age group, there is science content that has to be integrated. For example, electricity, wattage, energy, all that, you know, environmental science, green energy sources that the teachers try to infuse. So there is science, science as the scientists probably would claim is their ground, and then there are the engineering domain. So we try to help the teachers figure out what, what fits where. This is a challenge of the NGSS. It is also a challenge because a lot of K-12 teachers, and I would argue the majority of them, do not have an engineering background. And so they are wondering, what are we going to do with the engineering component? So while I appreciate the sentiment and agree that there is, um, it is important, it's, it is a matter of priorities and timeline, right? What do we want to do now within these constraints?